Hello, good afternoon. Um, thank you for, for being here. Uh, day three of Femsa representation, but already feels like a day 30 of Femsa representation, which is good. It means that a lot of things are happening, and a lot of things will happen today, actually, um, and will happen until the 4th of December, because we are presenting 20 films uh, across these nine days. It will be six edition of Femsa representation, uh, a festival that not only will present screenings, but also uh, sound and video performances, uh, a live cinema uh, performance on Monday that I would really encourage you to, to come and see, uh, a symposium and a series of talks. And today the program will uh, open with uh, an important talk uh, between Roberto Minervini and Sandra Ebron, but before uh, uh, properly introducing uh, uh, both Roberto and Sandra, I also want to highlight very quickly that uh, the day will continue after this uh, screening with uh, the UK premiere of Il Palazzo, a very, very unique film, 5.30. Uh, and um, we will continue with Gianfranco Rossi, a master class and, and the presentation of Notturno that was distributed in the UK. It's not part of the program of Films Representations. It's outside the program, but nonetheless, it's a film that uh, didn't have any theatrical real presentation uh, in the UK, so I it's worth staying and watch the film as well, which is beautiful. And the overall day will conclude with a performance on this very same stage by Daniel Bloomberg, a performance that will uh, encompass sound and image together uh, in a three-segmented uh, piece, uh, very unique. Um, we are here for uh, Roberto uh, Minervini. Uh, Roberto, I don't uh, uh, actually, uh, it would be an understatement to say that Roberto is a real inspiration uh, behind this festival because uh, actually he, he is the inspiration behind this festival because in 2015 I was in Cannes so uh, the other side of Louisiana, uh, which was already uh, the fourth work of Roberto at that stage, uh, the fourth uh, full length, and I discovered uh, a cinema that was able to um, uh, provoke and, and instigate uh, real genuine conversation on, on creation, co-creation, uh, and the idea that uh, with empathy, uh, a real sense of uh, uh, cinema can be uh, experienced. Uh, and, and that is something that for us, uh, uh, from the presentation, is very important. Roberto returned over the years uh, here at the ICA, um, and this year he's returning as producer of Dirty Feathers, that we will uh, uh, play tomorrow at 5 p.m., directed by Carlos Corral. Um, Roberto will be in conversation with Sandra Ebron. Uh, Sandra is uh, a very important influence on the programming uh, world, not only in the UK, but international, with over 25 years of experience. I know it's, it's hard to hear, but uh, that's what it is. She started uh, in Manchester, uh, Corner House. She ran this beautiful independent cinema that now is called Home Manchester. And then she took the helm of the London Film Festival for eight years, uh, bringing very important changes uh, to the festival and, and bringing the festival also internationally to a position that they didn't have before. She's now the head of Screen Arts uh, and the course leader uh, uh, of DMA of uh, Film Curation at the National Film and Television School. But now, please join me in welcoming to the stage Sandra Ebron and Roberto Minervini. Afternoon is um, in a similar way to Nico describing Roberto's filmmaking process. I think we're going to co create a conversation um, and not just a conversation between uh, Roberto and myself, but also one that will include um, as many of you as would like to participate. So we have, I have a few questions that I'm going to ask Roberto to get started. We have a few clips to watch as we go through the afternoon. Um, the clips are not at all intended to be representative of either the individual films or Roberto's filmmaking as a whole. 
Uh, they're there just as prompts, perhaps, to lead our conversation in certain directions. We thought that um, rather than go through everything and all the clips and then open up for questions, we would perhaps talk for a while. We'll look at maybe the first couple of clips and then we will invite you to join our conversation. Um, we have a very loose structure, so we are slightly uh, playing it by ear. I'd like to start with uh, what's really a fairly general question. You wrote an essay recently called um, What is Real? And in that, you said that you... Um, you never wanted to be a documentary filmmaker. In fact, you never wanted to be a filmmaker at all. Uh, and yet here we are. And so I wondered if whilst perhaps you didn't want to be a filmmaker, somehow you needed to be a filmmaker. Well, good afternoon, everyone. <coughs> I have absolutely no rec recollection of the essay. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it's well, and that's OK, because uh, because that's how I operate. I mean, I rely a lot on, me, on my lack of mnemonic abilities, which is part of what I do, really, because I, I, it's very important for me, as we were probably talking about, to kind of get lost in the process. Uh, that doesn't mean not to have control of it, but to get lost in it. Um, so, but I do know that I didn't really mean to be, <laughs> become a documentary filmmaker, for sure. And and even even more so, I didn't want to make films. I I just started <coughs> at the age of 38 and released my first film at the age of 41. Um, so I'm definitely um, that that is already an indication that I, I didn't plan mm. to become a filmmaker. Um, I I first of all I think I became a filmmaker. Becoming a filmmaker is kind of a a consequence of me becoming, uh, choosing to live life differently. Um, all my life from before college, I would say from high school, all the way to my 30s was <coughs> I put my needs before my wants. Mm -hmm. um, needing to make ends meet, needing to, again, find jobs, needing to provide, and needed to feel good about myself and who I was. And, so find some self or a sense of self-worth in the things I did. And then at some point, uh, symbolically and yet not so symbolically, 9-11 um, happened mm -hmm. and I lost my job. So it's not really a metaphor or anything. It's mm -hmm. something very tangible. Mm -hmm. I really did lose my job and I really did smell the dust coming from the, ta the Twin Towers and I really did lose clients in the Twin Towers. Uh, and, and I was an IT consultant. And then... And then, and then something switched. Okay, for the first time I felt scared and I felt empowered. And, and those two things for me always go hand in hand. Yeah. I'm scared, so I have a choice here to, to, to just live in the shadow, hide somewhere, or feel empowered, roll up my sleeves and, and, and do something about it. So, so I did feel empowered and I say, okay, it's time to put my wants before my needs. And, uh, and I want to express myself, I want to have a voice, I want to finally, you know, uh, you know, matter mm -hmm. for myself and for others. And, and, and so I looked at some fo forms of self-expression. I went back to school, got a master's in media studies. I got very acquainted with the best, you know, some of the best war uh, photojournalists, and I thought that was going to be my outlet. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it was too scary, and I didn't do it. Um, I wanted to do something with music. I just, lack of talent didn't allow me to, <laughs> to, to do it. And, uh, and so the third choice was really try to, to work with a camera. And, uh, and I was, again, as I said, I didn't need to do it. I just wanted to do it. So I did it on my terms from the beginning. And Why was photojournalism too scary? Oh, well, we just didn't want to die. You know, <laughs> I really didn't. I, I studied with David Turnley, who won a Pulitzer Prize from, for his work in the first Gulf War. Mm -hmm. And uh, he himself told me stories of losing sanity as you had to be numb in front of death. Because you really had to, if you're chatting with someone, and someone maybe in the Gaza Strip, like he told me, drops dead, and you had to take a picture. Yeah. 
uh, you do that, uh, that's your form of uh, kind of, uh, you know, giving back to the community, right? You take a picture and uh, you, that's a testimony of what you experience. And yet there's someone who's dead. Mm -hmm. and, and he said, and I know that if I, that picture was of a wedding, I would not, nobody would care. Yeah. I mean, definitely nobody would care to pay the bills for him or, or cut a check, cut him a check. He's a magnum photographer, he's been around, and, and so I really wanted to do it. But then, you know, uh, when w I got to the point where I really had to understand that, um, <coughs> that the, you know, the risk you're taking is really, you know, your life could end. And, and I really thought, you know, risks and benefits here, I, I, I don't think so. So I didn't. Um, and it's still a regret. I don't think I would be able to do it now because still I don't want to still die yet. But, but I regret. And that is also part of self-judgment. I don't like the fact that in the end I ended up making films which <coughs> apparently could be a safer form of self-expression. I might not die doing it mm. uh, unless you're Alec Baldwin and working with Alec Baldwin and, and shoots you. But you usually don't, you don't die or the chances, the likelihood of dying, dropping dead is, is much lower. And yet, you know, there's a lot of self-judgment in having quit because I was scared. And that is also coming back over and over and over in my films, mm. you know, mm, self-judgment. But also, and this might be something that we come to later, you do, you m may not have put yourself in really very life-threatening situations, but you do sometimes in your filmmaking put yourself in a place of risk. I mean, different kinds of risk. Um, uh, and actually, there is a sort of, uh, you know, there's a difficulty in the process of making films that you face every time. I think there's always some fear that you face every time you make a film, isn't there? Whether that's a sort of internal or external fear. Yeah, so there's different kinds. Of, well, that's a surprise and maybe the beauty of filmmaking, that the fear comes back at me in different forms. Mm -hmm. uh, there is some sort of internal primordial fear um, of uh, not, unlike a picture, it, it filmmaking is a long process mm -hmm. and it starts from very far away and it includes a lot of people and a lot of people have their needs and their wants and, mm -hmm. and it's an art that implies some degree of compromise and, and, and uh, interact, interaction and exchange, all of that. And um, fear not making it, mm. not really with my life, with my, you know, physical, you know, in, in, in integrity, uh, but yet not finishing a project is there. So there is a lot of letting go that happens uh, during the film process. So fears as, um, um, kind of manifest in different, different ways. And there has been r recently, at least the past two films, some sort of physical, sense of physical danger. Mm -hmm. But the fact that I'm not alone in that, <coughs> I have a little microcosm of very trustworthy people working with me. And uh, th I love them to the point that if I'd rather have them die than me myself. You know, I'm, just <laughs> I'm just kidding, but, but uh, there is an example. <laughs> you know, some of them are here. And there's an I mean, in the last film, just to be very scattered here, but you know, being anecdotal too, in the last film we had the Black Panthers clashing with the police before our eyes. We're talking a few feet in front of us. I heard bullets being shot. I didn't know they were rubber bullets. Um, so I, I just threw myself, you know, the ground and I saw a friend of mine, one of us, you know, uh, you know, drop into the ground. I thought he got shot and I was hyperventilating and then I saw well, at, you know, some of them are here. They were just actually their sound, there's camera, they're all here. Mm -hmm. And they were just, I, I looked around, uh, you know, uh, panicking. Mm -hmm. And they were just doing their job. I mean, mm -hmm. I still remember, you know, Carlos was fully in focus. Carlos, the director of tomorrow's film, Dirty Feathers. And he was just concentrated on fully in focus. So, in that sense, I think that that was reassuring. Not that the fact that they were going to get shot, but the fact that. You know, you're really not alone in yeah. filmmaker, and there's people committed to a to to a vision, and and that is uh, something magnificent. Mm. There's something very very important that drives me to you know keep going. Mm. 
So I imagine that there are quite a few pe people in the room who will have seen uh, at least some of your previous films, the first three films that are often loosely grouped together and talked about as a sort of Texas trilogy, and then the two films that came after that, The Other Side and Stop the Pounding Heart. When you come to a project, when you're imagining a new project, where do you start? Is it, uh, is it an intellectual process? Is it an emotional process? Where are the beginnings of your films? Um, at first, it's a, re a relational a pro a process. I, I look around uh, my environment, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I do this because there's kind of circle, there's, there's you know, um, perimeters. Mm -hmm. You know, the closest one, level one. You know, some people very, very close to me. Then there's second home this small <laughs> like a second layer zone too you know right there's other people and then I see who or those people whom or those people close to me really have you know have inspired me throughout the years I've looked up to or looked down uh, I went one up one down mm -hmm. and I and so that rel being relational triggers being emotional about it so then I have an emotional response and then I looked at all that so Am I attached to them? Am I, you know, no, no matter whether 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 um, I feel com, com, conflicted, I feel you know antagonistic about it, or, or close to them, you know, on the in the other side, my film, the other side, you could see that there's some antagonism at times, you know, with some of my subjects, and then I see all that, and then I, uh, uh, and then I start. You know, thinking about a story. If there is just something to be a story to be told, right? when I say story, I don't mean film. I mean um, a story to be experienced. You know, the story we're going to build by being, you know, spending months and months and months together. A story we could tell our grandkids. You know, that kind of deal, like of being together. There's a story um, that I would like to experience, be part of. And then, uh, so yes, the intellectual aspect comes much much later mm -hmm. if ever I, I don't know that that is uh, I'm very wary of that intellectual approach um, uh, that triggers uh, immediately as soon as I intellectualize things that means that I want to make things my way mm -hmm. is intellectualizing is a very internal process uh, um, that, uh, that, 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 that gives me a lot of control um, I push the discourse to a different level like I'm doing now it seems like that this is, if this is, people might think that this is what I do when I analyze, when I process, no, not at all. Yeah. It's just emotional. I hate it, I like it, damn it, you know, all of that. Like, oh, what am I doing all three months with that? No, I don't like it, oh my God, I love that. So it's much more bare to the bone mm -hmm. than this. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it's an informal, uh, or very primordial, very visceral way of seeing a project. Mm -hmm. um, this intellectualization comes much later, and I'm, as I said, I'm wary of it because um, I get attached to intellectualization. I get, you know, th there's a lot of narcissistic. The narcissistic self loves that. I love it when I read film, cri you know, reviews on my film. I love it when people talk, when yeah. people lead a master class, yeah, and they yeah. say, wow, you know. That, um, I love the introduction to me, and, and all of that will be an immense, for example, I'm about to approach a new project, and hearing all this is amazing, but I need to immediately go and connect, mm -hmm. because if I stay at this level, which is, this is symbolic, actually, I like the bullets and that, and that will be the Twin Towers, you know, being a little up here on a stage with spotlights, yeah. not really, but with lights on me, <laughs> uh, you know, this is, this is, it will affect, if I continue to do this, it will inevitably affect the way I will conceive a new project, which will be result-oriented. I just want to come back here yeah. with a full house, maybe, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and succeed. And, and it's a very dangerous, slippery slope for me, and I don't want to be there. Well, and then the, the intellectual as the sort of defense against the experiential and the feeling. And, but it's interesting the way you describe the sort of... Um, the journey through those steps when you're making a film to the sort of final intellectualizing, it, in a sense, is, uh, is similar to my experience watching your films. The first response is very emotional and actually often quite visceral. Um, and it's only later, I, for me, that I'm then able to kind of start to 
think and articulate, but it's very, but the feeling is very strong in the moment of watching the film. And I'm sort of hoping that this might be a good point to watch the first clip, because this is a clip from Low Tide, um, a film which I find heartbreaking, actually. Um, uh, it's always difficult when a filmmaker is here to sort of try and say what their film is about. But Low Tide, uh, I guess, follows the life of a teenage boy and his relationship particularly with his mother. The clip that we're going to look at is the opening of the film. Um, so perhaps we can have a look at that and then we use that as a way of um, thinking a bit more about how you work. So, David, if we could have the first clip, that would be great. So I wanted to choose the opening of the film because uh, for me it gives us such a, it, we learn so much about the boy in those first few moments. We learn about him, we learn about the environment that he lives in, we see that he's uh, on his own. Um, 
I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about how you uh, how you found him, how you came to be filming with him and his mother. I mean, I guess we can almost say, how did you cast him? Sure. Yeah. Um, for th the first, uh, how many do I, five films. So the first four films, uh, you know, the, the, the characters kind of either come back or, or, or uh, I found other characters or people through the people I knew. So they're all kind of, you know, uh, family. They're all related. Uh, by the most, very often they're related by blood. So in this case, the boy and his family, they were friends, very close friends of the family, uh, of the families uh, featured in my first film, the film that comes before that. Um, there's an event, uh, there's an event that allowed me to really get to know a lot of people in Texas where I was living until three months ago. I, I lived in Houston for 14 years. Um, which is the death of the uh, of the pr of my friend who was in my first film, The Passage, a tragic car accident, and he was a popular bluesman, and uh, so uh, the funeral there were th more than a thousand people at the funeral, and, and when w uh, I spoke at the funeral, and I was the only one not dressed for the occasion, meaning I was formally dressed, and everybody was kind of a biker, you see, it was biker blues, so, and I showed up, you know, in a suit, and uh, so everybody found out, oh, so this is who this guy is that Mean Gene was talking about for a long time. This, this is the guy. So I got to know a lot of people, among which there was this family, um, the Blanchard family, and we got really close, and, and, and Dan reminded you know, uh, me of, of, of my own self when I was young. Um, and so the process of casting him and, and his family became very, very natural, organic. And um, but already at that time, you know, I, 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 I knew actually from the first film that uh, the only way I could make films, which I said, you know, I switched from my needs to my wants, the only way I wanted to make films is to, to relate to them, the relation. I'm more often than not to be involved in it. The films speak about myself too. Now, for the first two films, I did it more literally, I guess. Um, there is a lot of my story. It was a little bit of autobiography in it. Uh, um, and then I, uh, I I understood that I could be relational and relate to it, like behind the scenes. I didn't need to do it on camera. Um, <coughs> um, and, and, that, and that changed the way I approach cinema. But he, uh, here I can see that I'm still I'm still in there. You know, I see myself in Daniel. Um, and that's why Daniel is there, because, because we're related. We're sim there's a lot of similarities uh, in the way we are, the, the, way the stuff we went through, our relationship with our difficult mothers. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so the way we worked is really to, to sh sharing experiences you know, with a language that was uh, very un ch childish, mm -hmm. because we're talking about Daniel and also myself as children, uh, so kind of digging into that, you know, gathering from the inner child uh, and mm -hmm. talk and, and things starting to emerge. This is not something that is prepared. Mm -hmm. um, uh, even the snake, Daniel uh, loves the snakes and na native, there's only two native non-poisonous snakes in Texas and that, that's, that's one, uh, one of them. Uh, and it's very, it touches me because the snakes are so scared and yeah. the terrifying snake, it just wanted to hide and, 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 and yeah. It, it always does, but mm, yeah. So that that is how you know I was following Dan, and and that's really all, all the way to the end of the film, really. And that idea of following the participants in your film. I mean, in all of your films, I think that's something that runs through as a as a way of working for you. Yeah, there is a there is a way of working aesthetically. Um, I have a reluctance, and I would, I w I, I'm not ready to do it, like to wait for a character to come to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm talking camera placement, although we don't place it, we hold it, but to wait for the action, someone to come to me, is something that disturbs me heavily. I, I feel like, if I think sometimes I, I imagine, I envision what I could do, let's say Daniel walking to me, mm -hmm. and I feel embarrassed by the, the, the mere idea of, like, how dare you think of that? Like, you are, 
patron, you are control. Are you a puppeteer? Like, how can you tell him to come to you? That is a violation of his own freedom of movement. And I feel embarrassed when I think of that. And 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 people who work with me, they know that. Like, we will never do that. Mm. We will let to be at service in a way. And the way of be a service for me is very important. Sometimes, at least the element of following, like you lead, mm. you lead. Uh, you in con you're in control, at least of what? In this case, at least of movement. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about it. Uh, many times, and we get into the house and we kept on crashing um, doorposts with our camera and lenses. But I would always say to you know my uh, co-camera operator, like that, that's I can't fix that because we have no choice. We have to follow. Yeah. What do you want me to do? Tell Daniel to move differently, to slow down. To I can't do that. We just yeah. can't. It, it would be, you know, a, a violation on his own, you know. It'll do something to him. I'm not going to reprimand him for what he does. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, of, you know, to date, I, I, I don't do that. But with this film in particular, um, d I'm really curious and interested in the extent to which there's then a tension, particularly if you're saying that, you're, that this film, perhaps more than some of the others, has... Um, you know, more direct elements of your own uh, kind of p personal history. So is there a tension between what you're hoping for from him and that idea of following and letting him take control and lead the process? Yeah, so that is that gets complicated. That's, that we step in, in my case, into the emotional realm or rea reaction. So... Uh, I don't think my films are built into action, reaction, cause, effect, narratively or dramaturgically speaking, but they, are, they rely on action, reaction in terms of em emotional reaction to something, which, which then you know, uh, causes some trigger, something else. So I do um, emotionally react to everything that is happening. Uh, I react to things, I, I take on all the emotions. And, and the question is, what do I do with that? Mm -hmm. And um, Ideally, I will protect. You know, I'll deal with my own emotions, and there's ways of doing it. <laughs> yeah. We usually are not on camera without dumping it on people, without reacting. So sometimes I'm very unsuccessful with that. So you know, how does I react? I mean, it all manifests through you know excessive empathy or, or excessive anger or um, you know fight or flight, wanting to leave, wanting to stay, and all that. Sometimes I'm more successful, and I say, okay, I'm, I, I'm emotional. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Well, many things. What do I do with that? Uh, well, I put a service of, of the process of generating more ideas. And I talk to the characters. I start say, look, you know, this, I feel sad. I feel angry about what I saw. And, and that triggers, you know, we talk about it, so we build the film together. Uh, in this case, there's a child, but not only a child. There are adults. Yeah. And when we, I started doing it because I couldn't take this, you know, this vacuum of emotions anymore. So I started saying, you know what? I'm going to tell you how I feel. Yeah. Go heck with it and, uh, you know, run away if you want to, but this is what's happening. And, you know, more often than not, people respond very well. And then they give me feedback. And based on the feedback, we build the film. So this might be an impossible question because I, it, it may not be always the same, but what how is it then when you're shooting? What kind of ap what's the atmosphere like? What do you try to create in that moment? So we um, at this time, uh, with the, for example, uh, this is a 2011 film or 10 years ago. Uh, we would keep the camera on and uh, and and, uh, and 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 shoot everything, and that created a lot of tension mm -hmm. because as you're dealing with everything, building a story, having emotions which is uh, mine, but then also, you know, as a cascade, you know, fat on the other people working with me, so all of that, and yet you have to film. And it gets over overwhelming. So with the, this is my second film, with the third film, we start thinking, okay, well, you know what? The camera is an on and off switch, and we got to use it a little more often. So switching the camera off, is, it became liberating. Yeah. Like, wow, you know, we can just be and hang out. And being and talking, and and then and then it became a lot, you know, like saying, okay, let's. Sorry, I'm gonna talk for a couple hours here. Maybe we will shoot, and people are like, what? We had to shoot. They say, yeah, but 
it's not time yet. I kind of want to hang out. And but that actually does something to the stories. Again, empowerment of the characters. You know, th this is again mm, we, I talked before about um, um, not limiting the freedom of movement, and then that became not putting always a limit on their freedom of being who they want to be. So if I turn on the camera, they are always in, ca in character. And when I turn it off, they're not in character. And they started to say, okay, your camera's off. Well, let me tell you how I feel. Let me tell you what I want. Let me tell you this and that. And then, and then we were ready to shoot again. And, and, uh, and, uh, and stories really thrived because I let them, I cut them some slack. Somebody told me once, uh, ca a character, but cut me some slack. Like, uh, turn off the camera, let me be a little bit, right? So I said, all right, you know, uh, you know, and then I, s and then it was great. Like, why, why I want to film this though, you know, but she doesn't want to. So what can I say? I'm, I'm, I'm pissed. But then I thought, okay, well, then I learned to trust the process. If I cut her some, cut them some slack now, I have to trust that something great will happen later. So was that then all sort of, uh, experience or learning, if you like, that you took forward when it came to make Stop the Pounding Heart? Because, uh, I mean, I hope you won't mind me saying this, but when you were at the film school yesterday and you were talking with students and we talked a little bit about Low Tide, I had the sense that perhaps Low Tide is a film, it's the film that you're not, you don't love of no, yours. No, I don't. I love the footage. Yeah. Um, Tolly is really overbearing. I think they should have taken it down a notch, man. Listening to it now, like this, the flip flops, man. This <laughs> one. <laughs> but apart from that, I like the footage. I know that the experience was great, um, but I, um, I wasn't. I was too even. I, w I felt very weak. I felt very little in front of the fi yeah. before the, the film process, yeah. and uh, and when I saw that the pro this film could have been, you know, could have been edited linearly, and I felt. That's that's how it's supposed to be. So I really yeah. don't want it, but I can't, I don't have my voice. I can't. I tried to say no, you know, but I, I couldn't find. I couldn't say to an editor who had, you know, such a resume and all that. Although she was my friend, she is my friend. But so and I'm dissatisfied yeah. because I kind of betrayed my own self. Like yeah. man, you know, you should have, you should have said what you really wanted. And uh, the antidote to that wasn't to say what I wanted. Was to feel sad and and then uh, go through a lot of that you know what yeah. is sadness I'm never gonna make a film again I'm not good enough all that so that's a good red flag for me it's like well no just, it's just a, I'm not gonna quit now so let's try so I decided to make another film yeah. saying I said before that I don't have good memory at all so I said we're gonna shoot people I know from those you know, uh, environments. I'm gonna shoot a few of them, and uh, and then we'll see what happens. So I'm gonna do. How am I gonna do it? Well, one day I'm here, like 40 miles from Houston, uh, northeast and uh, northwest, and then the other day I'm 50 miles south, actually southeast. So we'll do that one day, and then here and there, here and there, and then and then see what happens. And of course, the first reaction was, this is a, this is a colossal disaster. This is not going to work. I have to go back to linearity, to control, to a dead. That's why people do it. They're not stupid. You are stupid. And this all that. So it was like that. I want to quit. Uh, and I was talking about it yesterday. And those messages are very strong. It makes me shiver. Like, I can't do it this way. And it's a disaster. And then, um, but I had no choice at the point. And I, because I didn't remember what I was really doing. What is the footage I have? Wait, you know. Should I review it? No, that makes me feel bad, so I'm not going to review footage. And so I don't know. I just keep going. And anyway, this is not costing a lot of money. Who cares, right? Yeah. Um, so that's really how it sounds very raw, in a way, very, again, not really intellectually sophisticated. But it, this is how it was uh, very unsophisticated. So let's have a look at the clip from Stop the Pounding Heart. Um, and again, then, then we. Uh, talk a bit more and also we would like to hear from you so uh, the clip that we're going to see is a is one of the clips where Sarah who's the teenage daughter of the sort of devout Christian family that we are with 
quite a lot in the film is encountering Colby and his uh, sort of um, community. Um, and Sarah's younger brother is about to have a go at riding a small, I think it's a steer that he's going to ride. It's the two worlds coming together. So, David, if we could have the second clip, the clip from Stop the Pounding Heart, that would be great. To be this close. Yeah. Not watching on a big screen or uh, in the stand. Yeah. Uh, I think we're gonna get them to get on the one and see uh, on the on the steers. We're gonna get them to get on one. Right here. See what they think about it. Like out? Here in just a minute. I'm gonna go over here real quick. We're gonna get them to something round up here in just a minute. Squeeze a little. All right, squeeze your knees. Bow your chest down a little bit. Keep your hand right here. Y'all got that gait on done? Okay. All right, whenever you're ready, buddy. Okay. Ready? Squeeze. There you go. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. So we had already met Sarah's family in your first film, um, and I wondered what it was that made you uh, sort of return to the family, why you wanted to make a film in which they were placed much more centrally. Yeah, and we actually see Colby in the second film. So I had already, I mean, they were great friends. I had to say that, that Sarah's parents are writing the new film with me, and all the family will be in the new film, so we all uh, still, you know, together. And this is shot in 2012, so it's been a while. I met them in 2008, mm -hmm. so uh, it's, it's a big chunk of life already that we spent together. Um, I just want, uh, first I want to say, because I was thinking as we were filming, like we, I, I'm not trying to do like, cheap, deadpan humor here when I say I'm unsophisticated. What I try to say is, and as I'm watching this film, I say, what I mean is, like, you know, it's, it looks so glamorous now to me. Right, oh, what's so cool, right? They're both riding, wow, you know, this feels like Ozao making a film, something like that. <laughs> but the truth is, I, both riding or, or even any, some other stuff, it just came before even the, the idea of how that's gonna look on camera, because really I had no, uh, I had no, uh, even, uh, there was no formula here. It wasn't formulaic. I didn't know how to get to a stage, you know, that this film would be perceived. I, I didn't know. Um, I had no particular inspiration. As I said, I was filming this just almost in opposition to a, a, a method that I had adopted that, but didn't suit me. It wasn't what I wanted. It was just what I thought I needed. Um, so yeah, all of that, I remember being behind the scenes and, and talking to Colby, helping him out, trying to become a professional board rider, financially helping him out before the film. So all of that was just uh, an environment that I wanted to be a part of, hanging out there, wearing boots, and just, you know, and all of that is like, yeah, you know, I, I love this. I love this part of Texas, and why do I love it? Well, you know, maybe that's for another, for another time, but but um, so that is the unsophistication I'm talking about, this kind of intellectualization of things. I was not there at all. 
and um, after the fact, we can talk about this, and we can even talk about uh, the meaning of each of symbol, uh, signifier there. We can get into semiotics or whatever. I like to read. I know this stuff, but it's not. That's not the point at all. Uh, so I don't remember your question. <laughs> It was really about Sarah's family and what it ah. was about Sarah's family that, that sort of brought you back. And actually, it, uh, as you're talking now, of course, you're, it, as you're saying, there are sort of, they've become a constant, actually, in your filmmaking. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, uh, I met them in 2008 at a farmer's market. And, uh, and it, it, you know, we got really close I think my ingenuity or my way of being curious and, and being somewhat of a foreign Texan. I was living there, I know the jargon, but yet, as you could probably hear, I have an accent. And um, um, Yeah, I got them curious, we got close, and and uh, um, and, and very quickly we, we care for each other. And why do we care for each other? Well, we started sharing who we are. Uh, I can't help but sharing sometimes it's dumping too much information to like and meshing and meshment sometimes it's just sharing because that's w connection right i haven't figured all of that out yet but i'm trying to connect genuinely trying to connect so we were talking about this is religion the way they live religion this is not a set this is nothing special they're presbyterian christian presbyterians they go to church they just happen to be farmers and have 12 kids and just abide by the precepts of the bible but it's nothing more than being Christians. Yeah. Um, and yet I'm an atheist, but I'm not just an atheist. I was a devout Christian when I was little, Catholic. I just got caught by my family serving mass and I got punished for it. And uh, so I lost God, right? You know, God, no, you can't have God. That's, that was my family, it still is. So I couldn't have God, okay, well, I tried praying a little bit, but I was eight years old, and I soon forgot, and I soon realized that it, it comes handy to be an atheist, and later in life, you kind of, you know, it became cool, right, uh, an atheist, there were only two of us in high school, <laughs> so I kind of, hey, you know, uh, you know, so I kind of started digging atheism, and, uh, but yet, that is a wound, uh, that for me is trauma, it's not just uh, conviction, it's trauma. And uh, we, okay, I, don't, I don't know if we can dig into that, but trauma is also very important, right? Uh, that is trauma. And talking to them immediately made this, you know, this, this, this trauma, right, uh, come to surface again. Mm -hmm. Like you are, so, you know, you are who I want to be, but I'm ashamed of saying it because, and, and I, um, so that's how we connect it, really. Is that an intellectualization? No, I think it's the opposite of that because yeah. it's really bare to the bone feelings and uh, so that's that's why I'm still with them I was still debating uh, because we are writing a lot about Christianity and war mm -hmm. uh, writing really means talking and mm -hmm. recording our talks and mm -hmm. so yeah that is that is you always together and then of course uh, that you know as you talk uh, you know then trust emerges trust is established and which has nothing to do with, some people ask me, how did you gain trust? Well, that has very little to do with filmmaking. Mm. It just comes way before filmmaking, and making a film. Yeah. Yeah, and back to that idea of relating and the relational. Yeah. One of the reasons I wanted us to um, watch that, that particular clip was, again, we're behind Sarah, um, and yet I feel that we see so much of her in her response that sort of longing for what she's watching and then um, I'm really aware that uh, how much of my own subjectivity I'm bringing to this because when her mother speaks my heart sinks because it's like her it's like Sarah is sort of longing for something that then is uh, sort of uh, cut off but I'm really aware that that's my response and not yours, and that what your films do is they're very permissive in the sense that you don't offer that judgment. We're at liberty to bring our own judgment to the films. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I, I do think, you know, and this is a judgment. I do think that, uh, let's make it a nice statement, so it sounds less of a judgment and less virulent or, but I do think that I, I should be very mindful of the fact that if I want to speak 
about somebody, and that is, encompasses everything. Maybe even Donald Trump. I would add to have some experience, not just knowledge, but experience. I would add to, uh, otherwise, the, uh, otherwise it, it just makes, uh, for me, it's, I don't, um, I'm very, I'm not interested in, 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 in an opinion that is not experiential. That doesn't mean that it's, I don't validate it, it just it doesn't do much for me. Uh, because it's, pre, it's preconceived notion, it's referential, it's trendy, there are trends, it's, it's a background, mm -hmm. it says very little. I'm interested in experience, so um, uh, as that's hence the non-judgmental aspect of films. I'm just there. This, the film is I'm filming while I'm experiencing it, so I definitely no no place to even talk about what the people I'm filming because I'm experiencing it. I have some ex previous experience, but what what we see here uh, here is what I'm experiencing, and uh, and I'm and I'm gathering all that knowledge. And uh, now the, Ma the Maisel's brothers, uh, they said that the great thing about documentary is that it allows us to put ourselves in the character's shoes. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, they're the Maisel's, and I'm not the Maisel's, and yet I couldn't, I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. How, how, how through a film you get, how could I put myself in somebody's shoes without having never worn their shoes. It is such a patronizing statement that it really makes my stomach churn. Uh, it's what I've been doing all my life, mm. putting myself in somebody's shoes, uh, even more so, have forcing people to wear my shoes. Uh, uh, and if you can't fit in my shoes, yeah. then yeah. you know I ain't no Cinderella. You know, you're just, I'm sorry. And, and I feel like, so all this charge that I have, this emotional charge, is because I've been doing it all my life and I'm tired. Yeah. Because that causes issues, because then I had to, <sighs> I set the bar too high. Uh, I, can't, I can't do it. I don't think there's any validity to that. I started with the Penny Baker. And Penny Baker believed that, and he, had, and he uh, believed that by standing uh, far away from, uh, filming from a corner, that means invisibility <laughs> and no interference with the subject. And of course, I tried to ask a question, and I wasn't really sure that, that was true. And he just was very dismissive of me. Yeah. And I said, okay, you're dismissive. That means I don't trust you. Yeah. Because you could have been very, very uh, generous and, and telling me from your heart why that is invisibility. But you were putting on, a, you know, a uh, man is setting a wall between you and me, and you're bringing me down. So, um, And that makes no sense either. I mean, why don't we ask the subjects? Are you sure you're invisible because you think you are? Because I don't, I don't think you are. Yeah. And I don't believe you. Uh, unless you make me talk to your subjects. Because um, and that, that expands so that it's part. I don't know what the subject of this master, you know, this talk is about. But for me, it's very important. And everything that even concerns method, ethics, ethics mm -hmm. especially, it has to involve the subjects. Because yeah. the subjects are the holders of some truth. Definitely they should even speak first. You know. So um, I'm doing a very bad job as, as always of managing the time, but anyway, we have time. I would like us to come to the two most recent films at some point before we finish our conversation, because I think, you know, in terms of the questions around control and asking the subjects, I think there are really, you know, we, we sort of should talk about the most recent films. But it's already been an hour and we haven't invited questions from you. So I'd like to open it up and um, have some questions from you. And then before we close, we come back maybe to the two later films. Yeah. Uh, do we have a microphone for... Yeah, okay. So there's someone down here who has a question to begin with. And if you just hang on a second, the mic will come to you. Hi. Um, yeah, I, um, I, have a, I have a question about that clip. And also, it's something about your method, because I, I find your films very fascinating. And there's a clip... In that film, if I'm not mistaken, where somebody gives birth on camera in that film, which for me, ethically, you know, the, the trust that's involved there, you know, I've, I've recently become a dad and it was horrific to, to be in hospital and watch my wife give birth. So to allow a camera crew to be part of that was really amazing for me. 
I'm, I'm, two questions. I'm wondering how that particular shock came about, but also how do you, in this sort of co-creation method, how do you come up with the scenes? Because also in that scene we just watched, there's a real strong intent where you can see between the two youngsters that there is, there's like an emerging feeling and the way, and it's all in the glances between them. So for me, there being, there's a direction there. And I was wondering how you direct something where, which you co-create. Yeah, for sure there is. And uh, please remind me of the birth scene later because I'll probably get lost in this first uh, part. But yeah, for sure there's direction. And direction sound, uh, oh, it's a, this is direction. I was working with the Trishels, the Bull Riders, and the Carson, the farmers, go farmers and uh, talking about what I was doing the day before and my friends. And finally, we decided to get and have Mexican food together. And, and, and you observe, and, and all my crew members observe that, you know, in this convivial moments, relationships are formed. You know, people choose their own, they partner up. You know, it's all very organic, right, uh, in a group situation. And, and uh, but I started looking at that, like, wow, you know, these guys, they seem to get along with the other guys and so on and so forth. And, which is something that always happens now. You see but the people work with me having their own relationship and sometimes long lasting that have nothing to do with me, with some of these characters, you know, it's, it's all, it's just how it happens in uh, every kind of social gathering. Uh, so that was how they got together and we got together again and then we got together at the farm and then we got together at, the, at this uh, area with near the shells and, um, what bonded here is the kids wanted to try rodeo, so you can see that. This is one instance where one of the little boys try. Um, there's other, other moments. And, um, and then um, uh, Sarah and Colby have been kind of talking, communicating, but there was also a discussion that we had with the parents. Uh-oh, what's going to happen here, right? S Sarah seemed to be looking else, you know, beyond her... Uh, the perimeter I talked about. She was just looking. She was searching. And we talked about it. I can see that. And, and, and Leanne, uh, you said, you know, she, she was like, yes, I can see that too. I know that. Or oh, Sarah. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm scared about that. So we bring it back to feelings too. Right? I'm scared of that emotional openness. And Tim, the father, said, well, I, I see that too, but I'm not scared. Actually, I want to. Um, I mean, there is, I feel believe in something bigger than all this, in that case, faith in God. Then he was very adamant about embracing everything that happened. I said, we need to experience this, and, and, and so we did. So I said, well, well then we, we should have the boys, you know, the, the same age, hang out and shake hands. And, and it had happened before this. And, uh, but again... There is a clear, you can see the camera is very uncertain. I think the camera became more and more certain, confident in, in framing. Uh, I understood that you didn't have to capture every, every you, the, the kind of anxiety of capturing everything was present here. And then as the action moves out of frame, we stay now. We, cap you know, we stay, we give time. And I think that was also part of following someone, not betraying, uh, dumping people, hey, bye, I'm going here. But here we were doing it. Um, um, but yes, so we were, we were doing it because we were curious about everything that was happening. But we were also following them. So the camera doesn't know who to follow, but the camera knows that it has to follow them. Okay, so, and that is a small moment. And then, and then so is that, that is completely directed in the sense that I know what I'm going to film. Um, but it's not, it does it's not like um, we're not cutting the roots of what's happening in the moment. For example, the mother, Sarah, and, uh, and 30 more people were like uh, two feet behind us. It, we are all together. We're not far away, isolated in this private uh, moment where sparks are happening. No, we just, you know, as if me and uh, you and I were here, and everybody else was there, and they said, oh, come here, and all that. So it's very organic, and yet we direct it. I direct camera, and I direct, you know, uh, them, because I say, we're going to film you. And uh, I direct uh, everything based on you know, lighting. Okay, sorry, not now. You know, the clouds have moved. It's going to look like in a way that I don't want it to look on film, so we have to wait. Then we hang out. 
so there is a lot of direction and and uh, and and I continue to do that um, all the time I control space I control time and I share my view of things with the the characters uh, so Lode is out out there and uh, uh, yeah oh the bird I remember um, there's I don't know if people have seen this film but there's a bird scene on camera um, Again, uh, there is a there is a want from them to have a you know first of all Sarah's mother is a midwife, she worked on that, uh, so she knew women and life and death animals. There's a lot of footage, okay. So this is I th I see editing and making a film as a way of self censoring, right? Because it's by we make a film by omission, you know. We have 120 hours of footage. We, it, this is 90. Uh, or, or, or nine, nine, no, yes, more or less, a hundred minutes. Um, so we have a lot of death, death, animal death, putting animals down, uh, and all that. Birth, not on camera, but children are, are born. And then we talked about the meaning of that um, from a spiritual standpoint, from a very human standpoint, emotional standpoint. And finally, there was this woman who was going to give birth, and so we talked to her, and I, and I talked to her about why it would be amazing to have it. And she said, I always wanted to have the, you know, the clip for me. And I said, well, I can definitely do that. Uh, uh, but uh, perhaps I can do that how, you know, I can be alone in the room. I could be alone, so and stand somewhere, not because I'm invisible like Fanny Baker, but because I'm discreet for you, if that's in, you know. Um, and then there are things, I mean, there's so many things that, have, again, little to the filmmaking for which things are possible. I just had a daughter. So for me, <laughs> I was, so, yeah, uh, I was there just right, you know, after, it was all together. And um, so, yeah, so that, that that is part of, trust right uh, feeling comfortable with each other and and uh, knowing that you're not going to get hurt by my brain so all of that is a little tool with filmmaking uh, so we did that and uh, and then they review the footage right that's talking it from ethically what they need to be happy with it so once they're happy the first ethical um, roadblock is or, or checkpoint is actually passing you know, I can check it they are very happy and uh, and they're gonna be happy for a long, long time. So and that is very satisfactory for me. So it, it gives me uh, kind of the green light to put this on film, and then we can talk about other ethical roadblocks maybe. But for me, that is something that I'm at peace with that. So that is, I don't know, if, you know, that's pretty Thank much. You. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, there's a question right in the middle. If we could have the microphone there. Hi, Roberto. Um, I was wondering, you've mentioned the process of co-creation with the actors, but I was wondering if there is some sort of co-creation happening as well with the crew members, or if you could expand the crew members. Uh, yeah. Yeah, with the, in the production. So, like, you know, how do you um, relate to the other crew members if you always work with the same people? How many people you usually have in your shoots? And also the importance of technology. So what kind of role technology has in your shootings? Which kind of pieces yeah. of kit do you use? Sure. Yeah. Um, we usually, uh, let's say there's four people shooting crew, right? There's, a, a, you know, up until now, uh, me and the director of photography dash camera operator, so me, well, I'm also a co camera operator, so two plus sound plus focus folder, so first assistant. So four people have to be there. Sometimes, like in this scene, if you sound, you put a boom somewhere in a lab, if possible. <laughs> you like it. Uh, and then you could be three, and then if you don't really have to put focus, you could be two, and then in that case of the first scene, if I also operate the camera, then you could be one. But I would say you need four. Then there is a second AC. Always around five. It's another person helping. Depends. Could be a production and producer. Or we all kind of multitasking. Six. Total of ten. So you know, shooting crew four. Total of ten. And that's that's how we work. 
as I was saying, and, and, and uh, a few of them are sitting in front of you, the row in front of you, uh, or the or crew members. Uh, so uh, Carlos started on this film uh, with us. And uh, so, um, so, um, and so you remember that, I actually remember you, I remember Carlos playing a lot of soccer with the kids or football. Um, uh, so I started observing that, and I, st I liked that. I just said that when we were going to a dinner, you see how relationships are formed. Sometimes I was jealous of it, because I felt that why don't I have the relationship with the character, character or that, I, that is my main one? I'm the main one, he's the main, or she's the main one. Why, the, you know, the, the second, <laughs> what's going on, you know? But that happened a lot, like, and then it happened over and over and over. Like, on the other side, I had my main one, with my, hierarchically speaking, number two there at the photography, they get along so well, you know, joking, it's like, I can't do that. So, like, and, and uh, you know, that, that is, so it's partly, the, my, the ego doesn't really like it, but, but everything else loves it. Uh, and, and, that, and that is the point, you know, what am I doing this for, like for myself? For ple to please my ego and to go on an ego trip. Uh, maybe a little bit, I mean, I'm not immune to that, but, and then I, uh, or I'm doing it because something bigger than me is happening here, right? And, uh, and I chose, not that it came natural, but I chose to trust that this something bigger is the way, you know? And again, what am I gonna do with my emotional reaction to that? Well, I have to deal with it. Okay, not to get all the time into the sense of inadequacy. Oh, oh, I'm not good, you know, stop that. I mean, I hear you, I mean, I hear myself, but no. Um, I don't want that to control me, at least when I make films. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's how it works. So the, everybody has the, their own relationship with the, with the subject. It's always been like that. Um, I'm sure even people in front of you could tell you they're on social media or by f over the phone, they have their own relationship. I don't, I, I don't know. Um, some people have, yeah, so that's, and that's the, the beauty of the process. And, and as far as technic uh, technical, uh, you know, so this is, Soft Abundant Heart is my first digital film. Uh, towards the end of Low Tide, I was saying that I was trying to capture everything. So what I started doing, that was a two perf 35 millimeter film, which means half of the frame, therefore, twice the length mm -hmm. I could use twice. Uh, the the uh, film roll lasted twice as much. So that means eight minutes or so. Uh, so I started saying, shoot one roll. Every time one roll, one roll. <laughs> Not really cost effective, but luckily Fuji would throw film stock at you at that time. Nobody wanted to shoot films, so why not? And I would observe what, what happens here when you shoot for eight minutes. Uh, you, you could see that you know, again, you are really forced to follow, to be led into something, because what, um, which is something, as I said, I, would int I was interested in, you know, follow people's lead. So here we go in digital because, um, because we want it, and we really, this is my third film, and uh, m you know, I'm not going anywhere, meaning there's no uh, income from film. Uh, so uh, we need to cut costs. So we're going digital. There's this new thing called Red Epic X. So 27 minute takes. That was awesome. So we started doing 27 minute takes. And that's how we started thinking, okay, 27 minutes, we need to pass the camera onto each other's shoulder because I can't hold the camera for 27 minutes. Um, and so we started doing that. And then in order to follow like I said, you have to follow the lead, and then you can't just stop the process all the time and, and take care of the technicalities. What does that mean? Well, one lens all the time um, and, and all that. Um, uh, so the, this is, I don't know what, it's called the aesthetics of framing, but you know, uh, that's why sometimes even talking to Nico, I said the aesthetics are always dictated by circumstances. Yeah. Aesthetics are for me extremely circumstantial. And in that case, I found out that, wow, we want lens and a uh, certain depth of field, which worked for us, worked for focus, sometimes made it complicated, but you know, mm -hmm. since it's one lens, let's make it beautiful. Uh, what does it mean beautiful for us? Well, shallow depth of field, okay. Yeah. It's complicated, yes, but 
So all of that has been informed by circumstances. So that's the technical aspect of it. It's, uh, it's what the camera always hand, uh, held, uh, never cutting, so that you can capture a lot of the stuff, the passing it onto each other's shoulder, and always one lens, one focal length. And, um, and then, yeah, that's that. But that shallow depth of field seems to be very aligned to what your intention in the films uh, is. And um, I would like to show the clip from the other side uh, and then we continue with the questions. Actually, the clip that I'm going to show is from the end of the other side. And, in, and I think if we were sh showing some of the, the earlier clips between Mark and Lisa, we'd have a stronger sense of that very shallow depth of field and how that creates a sense of uh, closeness and intimacy. However, um, I have chosen the clip from the end for sort of other reasons. So, David, if we could have a look at the third clip, which is from the other side, please. Let's go ahead and step step back and uh, we'll bl just go ahead and blow a shitload of holes in it, and then we'll we'll yeah. blow the fuck up. <coughs> oh man! Oh, you gonna go ahead and blow one of them off? Who oh, was ready? Who's ready? Oh, let's go. Stay <laughs> with. Say what we think about it. Almost went in the truck. The whole speakers. Hey, let Dude, me see. Fuel to the fire. Hey, yo. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I do. Reminds me of that game, Twisted Metal. Reminds me of Grand Theft Auto. Fucking America! I mean... <laughs> I forget everything. Uh, you, you, you had a question, but I want to say a couple of things. Like th this, this clip that you chose, is I don't, I didn't even know what you, cho what you chose, right? So this reminds you of two important things, right? One is the, what I was saying about the importance of being relational, and some, when the camera is off, and two, the importance of allowing people to perform, uh, the performance of the self. So I'll try to remember those two. But I want, like, this was my birthday. Usually we we used to get, we stop. Um, we end the shoot. Sometimes it's hard to understand when to shoot. When to end the shoot, you sometimes we do it on my birthday, July 31st. So this was my birthday. We went there. The shoot was was over. Mm. We went there to have a cake. To, they 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 had a cake for me. But they had also the surprise, right? A car. Uh, and I remember that I was just going to enjoy it. Remember, uh, some of the crew, were there, some somebody wasn't even there anymore. They left. America. And I remember that I was thinking, all right, well, let's take a look. Let's sit down, enjoy, eat the cake, and look. And I think Carlos was you. I said, like, why don't we film it? I said, I don't know. You know, just, I was just going to hang out. And, and this by my orders, I know, but Carlos went and took the camera. But now you were there too, right? It was the three of us and, and, and what's, and, and, uh, Eloise, Eloise. And, um, 
so we were uh, there, and, uh, but Carlos still brought the camera. Because that, it, that says a lot about, you know, how we operate, right? He, they were feeling something that I wasn't feeling. I was on to enjoying it, and uh, they were on to, like, well, let's enjoy it, but also it's, maybe it's time to turn the camera on. So I mainly filmed it, uh, and it was extremely organic, and yet it looked so aesthetic, you know, so um, staged, and, and I felt like, wow, this looks so perfect. And yet it was just, okay, the sun is over there, I'm never shooting with the sun in front behind me. Anyway, because I don't like it. I was like, it says going down, I'm gonna shoot from here, and that's it. Uh, so the aesthetics are set, the teddy by the condition. It's only me, I need to be more static because I get tired. Sometimes I sat down, and uh, there was focus pulling, there was, there was sound, and that's it. Um, so um, that was, the, the way that's, the reason why that scene happened is just because we were being relational despite the film, mm -hmm. or in spite of the film. So they just wanted to have a good time on my birthday. And they wanted to, make, you know, make me laugh, have fun, and challenge me, you know, by showing me what they did show me, right? Um, blowing up the, the, the car. Anecdote, then police showed up. Remember, the police showed up, we filmed that. It's like, what's going on? And somebody said, we just, it's okay, we just blew it's just Obama in the car. So the policeman said, okay, well then you can keep going. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so we kept going. And um, so, and then being, and then uh, the performance of the self. They, they, they show, they cl it's clear, even burping is, on, is close to camera. Everything is, there's a total awareness of what, uh, what the facts that the performance has on, on me. There's a total, but I see that, first of all, performance of the self is for me what cinema, reality-based cinema is about. Uh, this is no exception to anything. It might be, to my perception, it might be more visible because it's reminiscent of something that I see or different kind of films, like fiction, but it's the same thing. The performance of the self is, is I think, the only thing that a documentary could capture. So that's, that's what it is. And uh, so I welcome that. Some people would ask me, well, how do you deal with the fact that they might be performing? Mm -hmm. It's like I deal with the great joy because that means that they're empower, comfortable enough to, to flex the muscles and, 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 be, and knowing that this is their chance to shine or, or, or provoke. And that is being a constant. Um, I, I, this is the moments where I, it was very clear for me. And that informs my method and that informs my aesthetics. So. Um, yeah, so those th that that scene is really for me. Those those two things are very clear, and I I'm reminded of, th of those two things very clearly. And and I almost don't need to really ask you a question then about that scene because I think you've preempted some of the, uh, you know, sort of uh, areas that I hoped we might talk about around that scene. But I guess the other thing that I was interested in is um, it's a little different from I think. Uh, stop the pounding heart, whereas audience members, we have characters that are, um, uh, you know, they're fairly likable, they're fairly easy to uh, bring a lack of judgment to, I guess. And here we have characters that for many of us as audience members, we might feel at best ambiguous towards or ambivalent towards. And yet for you, the idea of, uh, you know, uh, fostering trust and intimacy and particularly creating a safe space where the people who you're filming can be themselves. How do you manage that process uh, if you yourself might also feel ambivalent towards or uh, ambiguous about those characters? Or, or is that not your feeling? I mean, is that our feeling but not yours? Oh, it is my feeling. Uh, I agree. I had the same reaction, but uh, this goes back to Stop the Pounding Heart, where I felt comfortable. Yeah. I saw the beauty. I saw even even pictorial. Yeah. Wow. You know, I got enamored with what was seen, you know, and I started patronizing everybody, like, oh, the, the girl, you know, the Ah, this Virginia, you know, and all of that. And then I think this is when really the audience plays a huge role for me. It's not the ethical discourse. It's the fact that the audience, the fi I think the film mirrors a lot of stuff for the audiences. The p people are triggered. 
but then I'm triggered by the audience reaction. And I think that is, I think every time I had a screening and the audience responded, I think that is part of my filmmaking process. I think it's, so it's circumstantial, but it's also the audience response helps me really figure out what I did and what I will do, what I want to do, because then I started seeing worldwide, so cross-cultural response, and that's very important. You start seeing how people uh, had a similar reaction to mine, like, you know, and, and, and there are a lot of, a lot of um, signifiers, a lot of keywords, like Sarah got saved by then, you know, uh, you didn't take a fundamentalist Christian family yet, maybe salvation, maybe even freedom, emancipation, and then, but I, but I know them. And as I said, they need to be part of the discourses. Uh, this is nothing, there's no, it's, it's not, no, it's not like that. I agree though, but it's not like that. So, and that's when I felt, maybe this is a little bit of a side effect, which at that time was unexpected of me liking, working with very likable mm -hmm. characters. But likable is sometimes characters that are likable are characters that don't put me, how do you say, that, that, are, that don't put me in danger. I feel safe, therefore I like. It's a very easy, for me, it's a very easy kind of equation in life, right? I feel safe, therefore I like you. That's what we say, my best friends, you know, uh, as you know, I just lost a friend and collaborator because at one time I said, you know what, well, I don't really like the way you're behaving. That's it, you know, years of friendship evaporated in a second. So, and that is, maybe a lot of people experience that in life, right? So I liked them so much, but there wasn't danger, right? There was a, uh, so I said, well, you know, and I see how that, you know, that what that can do, right? What that can do to, to them too, like right? Everybody's rooting for Sarah mm -hmm. to escape. And guess what? Sarah did escape at night. And Sarah did get married because she met a man. And you know, I was in it. I was the only one talking to Sarah and the family for a couple of years. I, I, that wasn't that great necessarily. I mean, it wasn't all great. That, was, that didn't feel like emancipation. It felt like, you know, pain. Yeah. And there's people who suffer, and, you know. So I said, well, making it about myself, and I don't want to go off the tangent too much, but I said, you know, maybe it's time to, to try and figure out that question. What if the characters aren't likable in a conventional way? So what if I don't feel safe? I started looking around, so definitely this film, these people were in my first two circles. Well, a little beyond, <laughs> far removed, but Colby's jumping on top of the car, so Colby's still there, this is her film. He tried his luck and then militia, didn't really care politically, that was kind of quit, but he was part of it for a while. Um, and then I go, family members again, I moved to Louisiana, and the, the, the likability factor was less than zero for sure. And I talked about it in film school, I mean, the, the language used and... Um, just just mm -hmm, on that, mm -hmm. so you're saying that moving from Texas to Louisiana and Mississippi, that there are, that, that already kind of signals a, a change in terms of the temperature, if you like. Absolutely, I mean, Texas is a, is a very welcoming energy until it isn't welcoming anymore. But, uh, you know, it's extremely, welcoming and, and, and earthy and if you screw it up then then it get it turn it could turn sour really quickly and yet you know I feel I felt the harmony I love I love Texas but when you move to uh, when move to Louisiana northern Louisiana at least I don't know Louisiana I don't know southern Louisiana very well but northern Louisiana the energy is different suspicion is you know and, and being wary of each other is the first it's how you approach each other the first time what that does is that then you start provoking each other, flexing muscles, right? It's like, I don't know, what are the animals who do that? Roosters, maybe? Or cats when they're gone. So you start seeing that, and, you know, I'm always the cat who does this with me. Like, the other ones do this, and I don't, eh. So I always feel like, oh, man, you know, I, this is unsafe. And, but I was talking, in, in, in this film, as soon as I, I had the first meeting, it's like the, I went to a parking lot, I said, mm, I, I won't come back here, not like, they won't see me ever again like this. To hell with this. This is scary. But then I say, but this is why I'm here, mm -hmm. right? So that I don't want to go back to say it's my safe space, the first circle around me where I feel safe and I make a film and I like everybody. Everybody will like me and so on and so forth. Maybe even Khan will like me again and life is good and all that. But then it's like, 
as I'm talking about this, it's, it's something that it, it just doesn't feel right for me. I'm very lucky that I, when I think like that, that I have it so easy and I'm in control, I feel ashamed of myself. Yeah. I'm in a way lucky that I have this trigger, that I have this flag, that I don't feel good about myself because it's not exactly what I want. So I stepped into a little bit of the, the, the you know, uh, uh, very uncomfortable territory, and, and people who work with me, they know that I didn't want to film the second part. You know, these macho men who are, don't look like me, they're more muscles, and, and all that triggered the hell out of me. And I remember I didn't want to go there. And then they told me that there was a point in going there. A reminder again, it was it's a stem from me, but a reminder again that the, the experience was valuable. And I felt safe with people around me. I would never shoot a film by myself. Yeah. Um, I felt safe around people who, who, who could, you know, who, who, whom I could rely on. And uh, and so we did. But uh, so yeah, f f feeling un unsafe again. Then you see the reaction. Okay, and then the audience is coming to place again. And then you see the response. Yeah. Ah, so oh wow, Mark is great. Oh, the douchebag. But then look at him. He cried. Uh, beautiful, you know, empathy. But then, whoa, why are you putting those associated with my, those are despicable, those are. And uh, even though they talk about protecting family, even though the parents, it was all like that, but you can see how some imagery can erode, the, you know, don't give them, doesn't give them, imagery don't give them a chance. Yeah. And uh, you could see, and I wanted that, I wanted that. Um, so the audience is kind of validated this process through their many audiences, through their kind of, um, yeah, the triggers of being kind of uh, feeling uh, and uh, having antagonistic feelings again uh, yeah. towards these people. Uh, and I'm aware of sort of compressing time and moving us on quickly, but um, just thinking about that sense of your own need to have fear and the kind of work with your fear, that must have also been a, 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 a kind of very uh, real presence when it came to making what you're going to do when the world's on fire. Not because you were working with people who are not likable, but you were going into, again, a world that was even sort of further away from, at that point, your own direct experience. Yeah, of yes. So that was, uh, again, reassessing everything I did and and thinking that there was something that I've always been interested in is this kind of racial diatribe. I was interested in because I felt that something was off mm -hmm. in me. Something was off because here I was waving the flag of, you know, the white savior, which is a very pop, it's a very important, I mean, prominent figure, the white savior in America, right? The one who pontificates about things, and I know what it means. Uh, and I am for representation and all that, but yes, something was off, and I, and I, t I told anecdotes that can, can, be, can trigger people, but they're true, and I went, and I, I went, uh, so we, this is about black communities in southern Louisiana, and then there's also the Black Panthers in the new film. And when I approached them, when I met them, um, I just, in order to connect and also to soothe some of the fears that I had, I really needed to be open and honest. So I talked about, I talked about what I'm telling you, you now, but I also said, you know, just the other day I was at a gas station at night in a neighborhood where I'm not supposed to be, mm -hmm. and then I see a man, a black man, it seemed like he had something in his pocket, and I immediately thought I was gonna die, so the fear of black, ma of the black male uh, is in me. Now I could blame. I could blame a lot of stuff. You know, I could. I, you know, because I've read books about it. I could. I, but it's it ultimately, it's it's about me. And ultimate, this is happening to me. I'm in it. You know, I am a contributor to the p propagating the status quo, which is, you know, um, I'm for representation. But let's not too f let's not go too far with it. Uh, it's a class issue too. Uh, I like cl uh, I like class equal. I hate class inequality, but to a certain point, you know, as long as I don't get hurt. Oh well, it's again like I may stop the burning heart. Uh, as long as I feel safe, I love everybody. But I don't feel safe 
I'm giving you the middle finger. I'm out of here. I don't want to risk it. And that, I in the last film, the beauty of, for me of the process is just that modest op operandi too. But the way of thinking, it was it came back over and over and over. The Black Panthers, as I said, the the the, the way I can summarize my relationship with the Panthers is from their you know their words, paraphrasing them. We appreciate you. We love you. You're awesome, you and everybody with you. Uh, but uh, we'll never be friends because this is this is our this is our starting point, yeah. and uh, we're not here for your cause. You're not here for our cause, and uh, we can. And, and remember, someone telling me we're sitting here talking, man. We spend the whole night eating and drinking, and we'll never be friends. And uh, and that is in the indi I said wow so because some people question the intimacy level of yeah. the film is that what that yeah. you know the, the how much intimacy and openness it took to get to the level of distance yeah 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 yeah, uh, yeah so yeah that's I, I, because as you were talking I was about to say was that painful to hear that thing of you know we'll never be friends but as you say it's the true it sign of was. intimacy I had the worst time in london in 2019 when i showed that film i brought the panthers to london i risked a lot Nash, um, uh, uh, what's the name uh, security whatever in america what is it uh, the department homeland security where on my ass right all of that i read and then all of a sudden the audiences which have a lot of black participation mm -hmm. and they were not giving me kudos for that. Nobody was robbing my... <laughs> no, not and enough on the contrary, I heard that, I saw that with my eyes in a packed room, like people saying, look, we appreciate you. Thank you for giving us a chance to uh, go through some sort of catharsis here, talk to the panders, vent our anger, even mention you without looking at you in the eyes. Thank you for that. And I said, yeah, this is what it's about. And I don't like it, man. And I went outside. I told Nico the other day, I was crying outside here. I was crying because this is so, I really hate, I mean, it hurts so much, but it's why this film is working. And that's what the audiences gave me that made me understand that, exactly that. And I said, why Nat Turner, who's here, n not saying, hey, look, this dude is not an enemy. Why isn't it protecting me at all? Yeah. Because... It, uh, because it's not about me at all, and mm. and and it just, and that's why I made the film. But it felt like crap, man. It yeah. didn't feel good at all. So there's two different things here, which I've been saying since the beginning. One thing is, you know, the, trying to set some of the you know, the boundaries for the process. Uh, that is the process. That is the method. Ultimately, this is what the film means. And then there's an emotional response to that, which might inform it, but it, it, it not, in, not in the sense that I need to feel good or safe, because safety is the status quo. Yeah. And if I propagate the status quo, then it's the danger. That w how in the hell am I going to make a film about the racial divide if I want to propagate the status quo? It is freaking ha harmful to everybody. Yeah. And, it, and that would give me an immense sense of guilt that I could not live with. So I went through that. I hated it. I don't want to go and travel with the film anymore. It's too much. It hurts me because it says some truth that is painful. It says the truth of a man, a white man, who really wanted to do something about But a man who hates to have a child, my own child, in a classroom full of white people. Yeah. But he's not ready to put a child in a ro classroom that is all black people. And it's a freaking truth. And, 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 and this is who I am. And I'm dealing with it, and it hurts. But I don't. I don't want to be safe. I don't want to feel safe and, and perpetuate an, a status quo that is yeah. fucking us over. But Sorry. in yeah, but I in that to... but in that London experience that you've described, you're you're really describing. It feels to me. I, I mean, someone absolutely kind of taking the control that you. Uh, you know that you want them to have, but then equally you realize when right. they get it. Right. So that's the thing. When you get, when you say I lose control, I'm following. But that also means that the, the, your emotional response to that, I mean, it, it, it can be what sh I didn't expect. It can be extremely tough. Yeah. But to me, that is just a validation of the process. Yeah. If I make a film like the last one, and I don't feel uh, uh, kind of the, the, 
the, the, the, the magnitude of you know that energy hitting me, then I really have done it on, on neutral. And, and, and then why am I even doing it? And I know so many colleagues or people that they do things in neutral. That doesn't mean I'm better. It just doesn't mean that I don't want to do it that way. And, and it's my truth that I see some people that they do it in neutral. And Nico doesn't invite those people, so nobody here. People don't, don't work on neutral here. They may drive or even sports, and they go for it. Obviously, John Prank is one of them. And, and a, 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 you know, you take a, sometimes, yeah, sometimes you, you face plan, you hit your face, and that's how it's supposed to be. Otherwise, what the hell, I'm going back to being a computer programmer. So we have about five minutes more, and I have a, a clip that I think is lovely that we will um, show as we come to the end. But I wonder if someone else has a question that they'd like to ask before we, before we do that. Yeah, just on the end of the... Hey, um, thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering how this question of consent and co-creation follows through into the editing um, of the film. I guess I've been working on something for many years where the, my subjects, the people I'm making the film with, uh, I've been sharing a lot of edits with them and often they want parts taken out and it's incredibly painful. And I'm just wondering how you relate to that or how that process has evolved and maybe specifically with this most recent film, which has this new dynamic. Um, so as a, we don't, we're going back to the point of directing. I think that is for me directing what's happening. Directing is setting the ground rules, okay? Space, time, who's gonna be in it, what's gonna be set. So there is something, there is a debriefing that happens. Therefore, there is already uh, something that um, avoids the issue of capturing, stealing, things that could happen. There's not, n nothing of, I don't think there is a single, I don't know, there's very few instances, if, not, if any, that I have that the camera on and film something where, where people were unaware, you know, any of that. I don't think this happened. It, it happened once, and, and I mentioned it on some sort of interview. I don't remember, I know, I mentioned it to you. But I, I, it happens once where I had this shot, and I felt like, man, if you put this on, uh, this could be good for the film, for my career. But uh, it's, it's, it's precisely something that would, you know, would cause that kind of issue that people, you know, will break our trust, and I will feel really, I can't cope with, with that feeling of, of having violated someone's trust, which is the paramilitary or the, the other film, it's even more so than the last film, a baby, uh, I wasn't there, somebody shot that. The baby was crawling on top of the AR-15s or the machine guns, he was playing with the bullets. And, and it was shot, it was also very beautiful, image-wise. And I felt, man, you know, this, this you, know, you know, again, talking about audience response, especially film programmers' response, you know, there is, there is a sea, the judgment is so strong and, and, and I'd be praised for it. But I don't want to partake in all that because because it is not true that these people, these people care about their families. It happens that a baby moves around, and for them, the fact that it moves around and it ended up on an AR-15 is not a big concern. So where am I? Like this. So this is just to say that I think setting the ground rules before also allow us not to get too often into the situation where people don't like what is done. Uh, also, there is a process of reviewing there is a process of, but the reviewing it doesn't mean that I send a, a, a cut. There is a process of talking about what I'm doing and what I'm including. And, uh, and ultimately, there is the fact that I, I, me, the editor, everybody, we control the process and we have to be, and, and you know, this is a, um, a, we might end up, you know, getting feedback and then need to redo things. Um, that, that can happen, and that is for me part of this process of ultimately, the inability of sh of of, uh, of uh, eliminating this sort of hierarchical aspect of filmmaking, which is someone, the director, the filmmakers, or the filmmaker, the editor, has an, the, the power to reshape 
truth and to bio mission and uh, ultimately so is the risk I don't have a clear answer for that I can only speak from experience that we avoided getting into, into that the, the trust wasn't violated because uh, that our commitment to trust allowed us to understand uh, what we could use what we could not use I never n that never happened to me uh, it happened during the shoot we talk about it. We say, whoa, what was filmed? And also, yeah, it reminds me, I talk to them. They say, you know, whoa, what we just filmed? I think I'm expecting this reaction. This is going to be, this one, you're going to get slashed. No empathy for you guys whatsoever. It's still going to be so good for me, my career, the film. But you're going to get slashed. This is how you're going to be perceived. Mm -hmm. Then there's this other option. Uh, we re eliminate it. And now your character, there's something unexplained about you. How are we gonna get? Are we gonna get deep into that? You know, so I talk about that a lot, and we make choices together. Ultimately, though, I don't have a clear answer for that, and that is a, that is the risk uh, of being relational, and the, the risk of violating truth. But in the end, uh, I can again, for speaking from experience, it, it just it's going very very well until now uh, but maybe they will happen to me that one day I, w I would have violated the truth and I thought I was doing a good job and no it has a, it hasn't happened yet so something is working in this idea of setting the boundaries of, of doing a lot of what's called directing which is really making it clear what we're about to do and yeah thank you we've talked uh, you know we've talked about difficult subjects and the you know, sort of uh, trauma and the things that you've learned that have been quite hard to learn in m making the films. We have one final clip to end with. We won't have time to talk about it, but um, I'd still like to show it, if that's okay. It's a short clip from What You're Gonna Do When the World's on Fire. Um, and I've put it in there because in terms of an eff effective response, um, I think it's actually quite a joyous sequence. Uh, certainly that's the feeling that it evokes in me. So um, I think we'll have this as our final part of this afternoon. Um, David, if you could show the short clip from what you're going to do when the world's on fire. seconds and we can start the countdown but I wanted to say I think this was day one or a shoot day two day one day one day one and I remember after the scene for me I said this one's gonna be a disaster I don't like this this is cheerful again I was I I, I had the preconceived notion of how a film 
about the ratio that drivers should be. And I went there, I, w I was about to get into that process to say, look, I'm here with a lot of preconceived idea. Help me out breaking them up. And now that I see it, it's, you know, they were dancing to their favorite song ever. And, uh, and that was the beginning of something for me. So yeah, that was day one, which I had no clue what I was doing. I was completely off scene. With huge thanks, ladies and gentlemen, Roberto Minervini.